optimization and optimal control is something that you, you as human being, do regularly every day. Most of the decisions that you try to make are consciously or unconsciously solving an optimal control problem, like walking. Uh, or deciding how, how to come here on time. So uh, basically, many of the things that you're going to do uh, within Stardust can be translated into an optimization problem. Now, some of you will need this optimization more than others, but essentially, most of you can see the, the problems that you need to solve an, as an optimization problem. Now, the next lecture, which is me, would be more specifically on the deflection of asteroids. Now, as soon as the computer starts, Okay, <clears throat> the lecture will be about methods and techniques to deflect asteroids and the first part of the lecture today will be about some basic principles. You have seen already something in the previous lecture. I will show you a, a different take on um, how to compute the deflection and how to um, calculate the consequences of a deflection action. And I will also give you a, a couple of um, possible techniques to compute the deflection in the case you have a low thrust method. And this is what I'm going to do today. Tomorrow, I'm showing you a little bit more about how to model some of the technologies that are used to deflect asteroids. And I want to make some considerations on uh, the advantage and disadvantage of some of these techniques, looking at two particular metrics, that are the momentum coupling and the deflection system mass. Okay, so the amount of mass that you need to produce a, a given deflection. And then, if there is still time, <laughs> I will also give you an idea of how to propagate uncertainties when you try to design a deflection and, and you want to know how reliable the result is based on the knowledge you have on the system and also on the asteroid itself. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when we try to deflect an asteroid, essentially, we have three options, and, and the options are to change the velocity in the direction of the velocity of the asteroid, normal to it, or out of plane. Okay? So each one of these actions has a different consequence. So we can accelerate or decelerate the asteroid. We can try to nudge it sideways, and maybe try to change the orbit plane. Of course, if you, if you try to hit in the direction of motion, what you change is typically the eccentricity, the same major axis, mm -hmm. and, and therefore also the period of the orbit. If you hit sideways, uh, one thing that you might change is the orientation in the orbit plane of, of the asteroid. And if you hit out of plane, of course, you can change either the orientation of the orbit plane or the inclination. Hmm? Now, each one of these possible ways you deflect an asteroid is more or less easy to perform, and for the same amount of effort you put into deflection, 
you get a better, lower or higher final result. Okay? In general, when you deflect, <coughs> one thing that can happen is that you change the timing of uh, the encounter with the Earth. So if you, for example, change the velocity in the direction of the velocity of the asteroid, uh, what happens is that maybe you increase the same major axis, and so uh, you increase the, the period of the orbit of the asteroid, and so you might reach the Earth at a later time than the predicted impact. Hmm? So one important effect is to delay or to speed up the motion of the asteroid and to reach the Earth at a later or earlier time. <clears throat> so how can we compute this arriving later or earlier, and how can we compute the change in geometry of the orbit? Well, the first thing that, that we can observe is that when we deflect an asteroid, as Professor Conway said, we actually change the velocity of the asteroid by millimeters per second, maybe centimeters per second, okay. if we are really, really good. So the orbit of the asteroid after the deflection is very, very close to the original orbit of the asteroid. So we can look at the problem as if we had two orbits in close proximity and the new motion of the asteroid okay, is like a proximal motion of the actual asteroid in the proximity of the undeflected asteroid. Okay, so we have sort of virtual asteroid that is still moving <coughs> on the original orbit and the deflected one that is moving very close to the original orbit. Now the deflection is the difference between the two orbits, the position of the asteroid in, uh, on the two orbits at a certain time. But that, as, as you heard also before, is not probably what you really want to compute. And we will see why in a second. So what you really want to know is if we look at the incoming asteroids from the point of view of the Earth, did we actually manage to avoid an impact, so to have a so-called impact parameter, which is uh, the distance between essentially the center of the Earth and the asymptote of the incoming asteroid, okay, which is larger than the uh, radius of the Earth plus something, okay, to have some sort of margin there. So what we actually want to do is to compute the velocity <coughs> um, and the uh, position of the asteroid at the predicted impact with the Earth and then project this on the so-called impact plane, or B-plane, hmm? which is the plane defined by, which is uh, the plane perpendicular to the incoming relative velocity of the asteroid with respect to the Earth that goes through the Earth. Okay, so we want to project basically this onto the impact plane. And that is the actual quantity that we want uh, to know if uh, the, the asteroid is uh, safely removed from a, a collision course with the Earth. Um, deflection methods are uh, generally classified in, in two groups, but I, I'm going to give you also another classification that is potentially interesting to come up maybe with new ideas. So one group is the so-called impulsive uh, deflection methods, like the kinetic impactors. So you instantaneously change the velocity. And then what you uh, 
propagate is the new set of orbital elements and with that new set of orbital elements you try to see where the asteroid is at the predicted time of the impact with the Earth. And the other class of method is the slow push or low thrust methods in which you thrust for actually a, a long arc and in some cases you actually thrust for such a long arc that, that you thrust almost till the, the predicted impact. So if we consider that in both cases the deflected orbit is in close proximity to the undeflected orbit, one thing that we can do is to take <coughs> a linearized uh, model of the difference between the position uh, on the undeflected orbit and the position on the deflected orbit. And you can express that in terms of variation of the orbital elements. Okay? So for example, these three equations are a linear approximation of the difference between the deflected and the undeflected orbit at a certain uh, time in projected in three, uh, on three coordinates, radial, transversal, and out-of-plane coordinate. And, and is a function of the variation of the orbital elements. So what you try to do with your deflection maneuver is to produce these delta uh, parameters. So delta is in major axis, delta eccentricity. And one important parameter there is the delta uh, capital M, which is the variation of um, the, the mean anomaly. This parameter is very important, and we will see it in a minute, because you can change it in two ways. One by changing the geometry of the orbit, but the other way is by changing the energy of the orbit. Hmm? So if you, if you change the same major axis, then you have an impact on the mean anomaly. And this difference actually propagates in time. So it, it increases with time. So even if you don't really change substantially the geometry of the orbit, but you just change a little bit the same major axis and you just wait, then this parameter keeps on growing. So <clears throat> at this point I need to relate the delta V of the deflection action with the delta parameters. And again, I can use the Gauss planetary equations and compute the, the variation of the orbital parameters due to an instantaneous variation of the velocity. Now, these variations are geometric variations. I change the eccentricity, the, the shape, the orientation of, of the orbit, the orbit plane. But as I said, the very interesting uh, variation of the parameters I have is on capital M. Because this one has a component which is just due to geometry and another component that contains time and is a function of the variation in the mean motion. Now N is a function of the same major axis so if I change the same major axis, I change the mean angular uh, velocity, and this propagates with time, multiplies time. So if I have a delta n which is different from zero, I just need to wait. And that quantity keeps on increasing. So this means that this quantity keeps on increasing, and when I plug it in back into that equation, I have two terms that grow uh, with time. If we have a low thrust uh, deflection action, uh, we have a similar variation of all the other parameters and we have a slightly different variation of the um, uh, of capital M. Now we have to include an additional term that 
contains basically the time over which we are thrusting. Okay? So the variation of the same major axis is actually uh, a little bit more complicated than before because we keep on changing the same major axis. It's not an instantaneous change. And that is a function of the thrusting time. Now, with this set of equations, I can basically estimate the deflection with any possible uh, action in any possible direction. So I can estimate the deflection if I thrust uh, along the direction of the velocity, against, the perpendicular, out of plane, okay, so all of them. In the previous lecture, you saw something very similar, but uh, with, uh, not with orbital parameters, but with a transition matrix and Cartesian coordinates. Okay? So it's, it's a very similar, the, the result that you get is similar because in the end we are always talking about delta, so it's a linear model. Uh, this is a formulation in parameters and before you had a formulation in uh, Cartesian coordinates. So what happens if I put everything on a graph and I try to find the best deflection, okay? So I have here the, the, the deflection, and I have, here I have the time uh, at which I perform my deflection action before the expected impact, okay? And you see here is the time is measured in a number of uh, revolutions of the asteroid around the sun. So this is a, a result that actually uh, Professor Conway demonstrated uh, some years ago, and, and, and we found, of course, the same result working in uh, um, orbital elements. <clears throat> if you are very far away from the predicted moment of the impact, and you take the uh, best possible deflection action among the three, so uh, along the velocity, normal to the velocity or out of plane, which is this one, okay? That particular, <coughs> um, sorry, that is this white one here. The optimal one is exactly coincident or almost coincident with deflecting in the direction of the velocity. Actually, it works also if you uh, deflect opposite to the velocity. Okay, so either you accelerate or decelerate the asteroid. So as you can see, you get a deflection that is much higher than if you try to hit sideways or out of plane. <coughs> and on top of that, you see that if you try to uh, hit uh, uh, normal to the velocity, there are points in which your deflection action is very, very ineffective. Okay, of course, because there are, if you go through the apsidal points and, and you try there to have a deflection action, you actually change uh, <coughs> um, the, 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 the deflection parameter very little compared to other points along the orbit. Now, this is true up to a certain point, which is, in fact, a fraction of the uh, revolution period of the asteroid, after which the optimal solution switches. Okay? So the optimal solution is no more to uh, change the velocity in the direction of the velocity, but to change the velocity normal to the velocity. Of course, the, the total deflection is anyway much lower than if you wait and if you, if you perform the deflection far in advance, okay? So. Now, the other <coughs> interesting thing is how a deflection that takes the deflection parameter delta r as objective function compares against a deflection that takes the impact parameter as objective function. So what happens if my actual goal is to change the B parameter, the impact parameter, and what if I measure my effective deflection with the B parameter instead of delta R? So again, I remind you that 
The B parameter is the projection on the impact plane, and the impact plane is perpendicular to the relative incoming velocity and goes to the center of the Earth. What we end up measuring and what we en end up doing are two slightly different things. Okay? So you see here the, the two results, they look very similar. They look very similar, so you have uh, for the, for the uh, two possible um, uh, parameter, uh, B and delta R, you have two curves that look very similar and very close to each other. But in fact, if you continue in time and you go for a longer time, and you don't uh, plot it actually in logarithmic scale, you see that the two curves progressively diverge. So what happens in practice is that if you look at the delta R, and you just try to measure your deflection in terms of delta R, you might get the illusion that you are deflecting much more than what you are actually deflecting. Okay? So the B, the B parameter is really the parameter that we want to use to get the, the correct estimation of how effective that maneuver was. Hmm? <coughs> um, this is essentially the same thing I, I said before. Now, the other thing that could be interesting is to uh, try to understand what the error is if we um, use this linear theory in which fundamentally there's no third body effect. So in this case, we are not really including the Earth into the equations. We are trying to solve everything analytically, so we propagate everything considering only the sun, and that's it. And at the Earth, we use some sort of patch conic approximation, and we switch uh, to the Earth, and we compute the incoming hyperbola and the B-plane. Okay, so what happens if we include the Earth since the beginning, and we propagate everything numerically? Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that uh, we get, in fact, a, a, a nice approximation that is generally valid for most of the deflection actions, if we go, for example, for a, um, the case in which the asteroid is impacting the Earth at relatively high velocity. So if the asteroid is not really following the Earth for a long time. Okay? So the two solutions, basically, if we propagate the full uh, equations of motion with the three body, and the solution in the case in which we use this simple model linearized with just the sun, and then we project on the B plane, they are very, very similar. Okay, so we have in both cases very similar solutions that are almost coincident, so they are generally valid. Of course, this is not uh, true if we include, for example, a a resonant flyby of, of the Earth. In that case, that effect is not included here. Here you have only the case in which you are deflecting the asteroid, and then later on you're just checking that you don't have an impact. Okay? So you're not uh, performing a resonant flyby of the Earth. You can also check how accurate is compared to a numerical propagation in terms of uh, uh, estimation of the, the magnitude of the deflection for different uh, so-called uh, lead times, so for how much in advance you perform the deflection and the magnitude of the deflection. Okay? And of course what happens is that if you deflect very much in advance and you have a very high deflection in delta V, your <laughs> difference, orbit difference, is much higher than if you have a very small delta V and a small lead time. So this means that at some point the linearization assumption, so the assumption that the two orbits are really in close proximity, breaks down and the error increases. Okay? So of course you have 
a larger error for a larger delta v and a larger lead time. But the error, the relative error, is still quite small. And even for 15, 20 years, with the typical delta v that you can actually achieve, which is more in this region, you don't really get a, a significant error to uh, not be able to predict the, the correct deflection. Uh, the other interesting thing is to compare what happens between an elliptical asteroid, highly elliptical asteroid, and an asteroid which is instead uh, not very elliptical. Okay? So the, the behavior of the deflection is quite different. Okay? And you see this periodicity, and the periodicity that you see there in the error is also the periodicity that you see in the effectiveness of the deflection. <coughs> Now, if uh, the deflection is so good that you manage to have a huge difference between the orbit of the asteroid uh, before and after the deflection, then the linearized model might not be accurate enough. But there is a way to compute the uh, difference between the two orbits just using geometry that is very simple and gives this set of fully nonlinear equations that basically give you the position difference in terms of the delta, again, of the parameters. Here, there's absolutely no approximation. Again, you compute this delta either as the result of a low thrust action that is on for a certain time or as the result of an impulse. So you have, of course, here your nominal uh, parameters for the asteroid. And here you have all the variations of the parameters. And if you take all these equations and you compute the limit of this delta uh, for delta that, that goes basically to 0, so you, you are trying to compute the same uh, delta r for a very small variation of the orbital element, what you get is, again, exactly the same set of equations that I showed at the beginning. Okay? So this set of equations basically converges to the set of linearized equations in orbital parameters that I showed before. OK, all this is good, but I might need to compute uh, the delta V due to a low thrust, a slow push action over a long period of time. And I might need also maybe to uh, find an optimal solution for that uh, thrust program. Okay? And what if I need to do it fast uh, with, because maybe I need to compute thousands of trajectories. Uh, be, maybe because I, I need to perform an optimization on all possible uh, asteroids that I want to deflect. Okay? Now, doing it numerically might be expensive. And so <coughs> one, one idea is to take the Gauss planetary equations and try to find an approximated solution to the low thrust motion starting from the variation of the parameters. So say that this A here, A R, A theta, and A H, are control accelerations. Okay? For example, due to <coughs> a gravity tractor or a low thrust tug. Hmm? So any method that uh, we might think generate a, a very low thrust, a slow push. Tomorrow we will see other, uh, other ideas and other methods are, in fact, probably better than, than the gravity tag or, or other popular approaches. So can we effectively find at least a first order solution to these equations that can be used to, f to propagate a low thrust control over a long period of time? Well, if we use perturbation theory, we can, in fact, do that, and we can find a very nice first-order approximation. 
The first thing <coughs> that is useful to do in this case is to rewrite the equations in terms of the uh, true longitude. Um, okay, the equations that I showed before are the uh, version of the Gauss planetary equations in terms of non-singular orbital elements. So we can deal with almost circular orbits uh, and zero inclination and so on. So we can try to rewrite everything in terms of the true longitude, which is the sum of uh, the argument of the pericenter, the um, uh, right ascension of the ascending node, and the true anomaly. And try to find a solution to this particular problem. And let me assume that we have a thrust that is actually expressed in terms of a modulus here, epsilon, and two angles that are the direction of the thrust. And this epsilon, the, the, the modulus of, the, of the, um, the thrust of the control acceleration, is very small compared to the local gravity field. Okay? This is a very important assumption. So this is a very small parameter which is in fact true in the case you try to deflect an asteroid because the amount of uh, thrust that you can actually, uh, sorry, the amount of acceleration that you can actually generate with any low thrust metal on an asteroid A is generally very small because it's proportional to the mass of the spacecraft that you use to deflect and we can all build a, a spacecraft that is as big as the asteroid so that parameter epsilon is really small for every deflection method. So in this case, we can express the analytical solution of the orbital elements as an expansion in terms of this small parameter epsilon. Okay? So this is the basic idea of perturbation theory. And of course, if epsilon is really a small parameter, we can take on the first order terms in this expansion, and in this case, the error that we make is small and is of <coughs> an order of magnitude smaller than if we just stop at the first terms, first order terms. We can do the same also with the time, okay, because now we are expressing the um, uh, Gauss planetary equations in terms of true longitude. And so we can try to compute the variation of all the elements in terms of true longitude and then solve the time equation and trying to find uh, the solution of, of the time in terms of true longitude. So if you take basically this expansion, stop at the, the first order terms, and you replace this into the Gauss planetary equations, you can find a set of uh, uh, approximated solutions. For example, for the variation of the time, you have an equation of this form that can be, in fact, integrated. Okay, that can be integrated in closed form and can give you two terms of the variation of the time as a function of the angle capital L. And you can have the same expression also for all the other orbital parameters, and all these integrals that you have here are in fact closed form integrals that you can compute by <coughs> solving uh, trigonometric forms of the angle uh, capital L. Now, if you use a reference frame which is radial, transversal, and out of plane, all these integrals that you, are, you have here can be solved completely analytically. And so what you get is a complete analytical expression of the variation of the parameters at any particular uh, capital L. Of course, the assumption here is that the angles beta and, half and alpha are constant along the integration arc. And the other assumption is that, and it is the most important assumption, that this epsilon is constant during the integration arc. Okay. Now the interesting thing is that you can do this even in other cases. 
in which the two angles, alpha and beta, are not constant. For example, if you have the situation in which the truss vector is not constant in a radial transversal and out-of-plane reference frame, but is constant into an inertial reference frame, which can be the case, uh, for example, if you have a um, solar pressure and you are orbiting around the Earth, and you have the, the effect of solar pressure, maybe you have a solar sail, and you try to deorbit something, the effect of solar pressure is in a or can be considered constant for a number of revolutions. Okay? Because the speed at which you are going around the Earth is much faster than, than the speed at which the Earth is going around the Sun. So you can compute a solution for several revolutions with this kind of approximation and then update the direction of the Sun and recompute the solution for another, another set of revolutions. Even in this case, these integrals can be fully uh, computed analytically. So we have a fantastic analytical solution for this. And you can do this also in the case the thrust is constant in a tangential normal and out of plane reference frame. But in this case there is a problem because the integrals are elliptic integrals and cannot be really solved uh, completely analytically. Okay, there, there, there are many methods to solve this elliptic integrals with uh, expansions, uh, but you can solve them with simple uh, numerical quadrature methods. For example, here uh, we use a, a six nodes Gauss uh, quadrature approach. So this is very nice because <coughs> this means that for both space debris and for asteroid, you can propagate analytically your deflection action for several revolutions and different types of deflection methods. Okay? So you don't have only one way to, for example, describe the deflection, but you have several possible control laws that you can combine. This gives you an idea of the accuracy. Of course, the um, accuracy depends on the distance from the center of gravity because epsilon has to be small compared to the local gravity. So here, for example, is the level of epsilon, which is the, the control acceleration. And here, this is the case of something that is around the Earth. And this is the semi-major axis of the uh, initial orbit. And as you can see, uh, this is the difference between a numerical integration and the analytical integration at the end of the integration uh, um, arc. If you go essentially beyond the geosynchronous orbit, you go midway between a geosynchronous orbit and, uh, and the moon, and, and you go up with the level of thrust above what is normally the level of acceleration that you get with a low thrust engine, so 10 to the minus 4, you go to 10 to the minus 3, then this kind of approximation tends to break down. Yeah, you, you get an error which seems to be small, but if you are trying to predict a collision with this, th this might be too much. Okay? And this is the error in time, which again is quite important because, again, if you try to predict a collision, you want to time your uh, moment in which the collision occurs quite precisely. Okay? So you want to predict this as well. Um, the other thing that you can do is to, to reduce, basically, the error uh, if you increase epsilon or if you increase the uh, the altitude is to use a so-called rectification process in which basically you update your orbital elements periodically. So instead of uh, computing a single solution for a very long arc, you compute a solution for a shorter arc and then you take those orbital elements uh, at the end of the integration arc and you use those elements to recompute an analytical solution. So this is an example of a circular orbit. And as you can see, every time I'm rectifying the solution, 
the error does increase as before, but I gain something in accuracy. Okay? So I can maintain basically the error much below than what you would do if you were propagating straight for the entire 500 orbits, for example. Now the other interesting thing is that here I'm rectifying every 20 orbits and the old propagation took uh, 0 0.02 seconds in MATLAB. So it's quite fast compared to a numerical integration. You can do it also with a, a, an elliptical, highly elliptical orbit. For example, this is a, a, an escape from GTO. So as you can see, of course, when you are escaping, the error explodes because you are leaving basically the, the Earth system. But for quite a, a long time, you, you have an error in, in the relative position uh, between the analytical and numerical that is uh, quite reasonable. And the integration time is extremely fast compared to numerical integration. Now what happens in the solar system with asteroids? Well, in this case, uh, we have a thrust level, so a, a magnitude of that epsilon, which is much, much lower than 10 to the minus 4. I mean, you can get maybe 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 8 meter per second squared. So in that case, the approximation is extremely good, because compared to the local gravity field, what you have in general, even for uh, long distances, you have a very good approximation. Okay. So again, th this plays in favor of, of the kind of uh, problem that we are trying to solve. Now the other thing that you can do is to solve an optimal control problem. Okay? So you saw before that one of the techniques was this Simpson-Flanagan type of approach in which the trajectory was broken down into arcs and for each arc there was a delta V, an impulse, and then all the, the, the arcs were connecting together and, and you were propagating forward and generally backward and connecting this arc made of a lot of small delta Vs. You can basically use the same kind of idea, but now each arc is the result of an integration with the analytical formulas. If you want to increase the accuracy for each arc, you can integrate backward and forward and then connect all the arcs. Now here the advantage in terms of uh, computational time depends of course on the number of arcs that you are integrating. Okay? Because the longer you can have that arc, the more you gain compared to a numerical scheme. So that you can put together all the arcs and you have a number of constraints that are basically how you match the ends of each arc. Okay? So you are propagating backward and forward and you are trying to match all these arcs that are analytically integrated. And your cost function, of course, is the total delta V, if you want, or the total amount for which the, the thrust is on, because epsilon can be off or on on each one of the arcs in which you, can, you, you integrate. So within an arc, it's always on. But between an arc and another arc, it can be off. So you have a type of problem that is similar to the problems that were described in the previous lecture. And you have an additional constraint here, which is the time of flight, the total time of flight that you want, has to be the time of flight that you compute by solving the time equation from the uh, true longitude. Okay? So let's take an example like this, which is a, a spiral from the Earth to Mars. It's a rather simple example. And you, we want to use this method to see if we can get a, a good approximation that then we can insert into a more accurate numerical scheme, like a, a, an NLP solver with uh, any 
collocation or transcription method or another approach using indirect methods. So what you have here is the result. Uh, we get a, a, a result which is quite good compared to a, a full numerical transcription and solution of the optimal control problem. And you see here in blue and in black the comparison between the optimal control solver and this low trust analytical approximation, which are very similar. And we try to solve the same problem with Simpson Flanagan, but in, in this case we didn't get a, a, a result that uh, we wanted with, with that approximation, essentially because Simpson Flanagan, what, what Simpson Flanagan does is to insert these impulsive maneuvers. Here, well, what happens if you try to propagate? you actually follow the contour of the thrust on each arc when the thrust is required. Now the problem of the approach is that if you want to make it extremely fast, you want to have very few propagated arcs. And the problem there is not really that you have an error in the propagation, but is that you have very few control points. Because along each arc, your uh, epsilon and the alpha and the beta, that are all the control parameters, need to be constant. So you can have, um, you don't have enough degrees of freedom. For example, if you try to solve a two boundary value problem, okay, so you have uh, six conditions at the beginning and other six conditions at the end, okay, because you have to match position and velocity at the beginning of the end of an arc. So if you want to have enough degrees of freedom to satisfy any possible set of conditions at the beginning and at the end, okay, you, for example, can fix the initial conditions, but then you have six constraints at the end of the arc, so you need enough degrees of freedom with your control to satisfy all the six constraints in the end. If you use a single propagated arc in which you have only to play with alpha, uh, beta and, and epsilon, and you have only three values, you don't have enough degrees of freedom to satisfy any possible terminal condition. Okay? Okay, now before we conclude this, this lecture, let me um, give you a different classification of the deflection methods. I want to give you a classification which is not really low thrust impulsive, but is more the perspective of the asteroid. What is the asteroid seeing when a space cut arrives and tries to deflect uh, its trajectory? So what the asteroid sees is essentially two types of actions. In one type of action, there is some mass that is ejected. So for example, if you take the low thrust tug in which you attach a space cut to the, to the asteroid, that space cut is ejecting something, and, and therefore you change the linear momentum. If you take the gravity tug, it's pretty much the same. You do not land, you have gravity that is uh, keeping the space cut attached to the space curve uh, to, to, the, to the asteroid, but you are ejecting mass to change uh, the course of, of, uh, of the asteroid. The same if you ablate the surface, you are ejecting mass. And interesting enough, if, even if you have a nuclear blast, we will see this tomorrow. If you have a standoff nuclear explosion, what you actually do is to sublimate the surface of the asteroid, and that part of the asteroid that is sublimated due to the radiation, neutrons, gamma, and, and other radiations, is basically ejected from the surface of the asteroid. And the same with the mass driver. Okay? You have these machines that are digging and, and shooting material away from the asteroid. So I, I really like this classification because it gives me an idea of the working principle of the deflection method. So I don't care if it is low thrust or not, what I know here is that all these methods work pretty much on the same principle of ejecting mass. Okay. 
Now, these other methods use the opposite, or a hybrid between augmenting the mass of the, of the asteroid or augmenting and ejecting at the same time. For example, if you, if you use the method that my friend Claudio invented and patented, what you're doing, you're blowing ions against the asteroid. So the, the, the point of view of the asteroid is that it's receiving the ions from, from the spacecraft. Okay? And it's pushed by this flow of ions. With the kinetic impactor, of course, the asteroid sees a, an object coming. So in both cases, there is a mass that is coming towards the asteroid. And in this case, the impact is generally um, inelastic. Uh, but you might have ejecta. And in that case, you have a mix of uh, increase of mass and ejection of mass. Okay? The ejecta in in increase the effect of the impact. We try to modify slightly uh, this approach. And we try to use a, a swarm of spacecraft, so a kind of cloud of spacecraft that are producing an artificial drag. And even in this case, you are increasing the mass because the asteroid can see this mass coming towards them. And you can do basically something similar that you can do with uh, uh, ions, but you can do it with light pressure. So you can try to uh, project photons onto the asteroid. And this has two effects. One is you have a directed light pressure, but you also have a localized increase of the Yarkovsky effect because you are heating up locally the, the, the asteroid and the acid is re-emitting. So also the last concept is a bit of a mix because you are increasing, uh, because you are receiving uh, photons and at the same time the acid is re-emitting photons at a different frequency. Okay, so this is me for the first part of my lecture. So if you have any, any question, uh, and after that we have lunch. Want me to do it? OK. So <clears throat> the idea is very, very simple. And you have the asteroid here. You have a spacecraft. The spacecraft is blowing ions towards the, the asteroid. And it has another engine on the opposite side that is thrusting. OK? So yeah, the. Okay, the, the, there are two problems with that. One problem is that uh, if you don't stop the rotation, you're actually thrusting for half of the period, or you put two engines. So if you put two engines, you are exactly in the same situation. The other problem is that you have to land and attach whatever you need for your engine on the surface of the asteroid. And that has two or three problems. One is that if you need to generate power on the surface, it's dif different than if you need to generate power away from the surface. Okay? You can deploy probably your solar arrays as you wanted. Okay? So the rotation is a problem, and the landing is a problem, the attachment is a problem. The surface of the asteroid might not be as you expect, might not react as you expect to something that is on the surface. Okay? So there are a number of advantages in using something that is standoff, so it's, it's away and is actually controlling everything from the distance. Okay. Um, you can also control the spacecraft better than if you try to land on, on the surface. Okay. In, in, in some cases, not always. And the other thing that is interesting is you can downscale the ion beam shepherd and apply it to a piece of debris. And, and again, there there are complications if you try to land on a spacecraft. Okay? And if you try to att attach yourself to a spacecraft. So if you stay away and you try to control the motion of the spacecraft, with this method, you solve a number of complications that are related to rendezvous and docking and stuff. 
you gain the accuracy and you're losing computational time. Uh, because essentially, in terms of uh, floating points operations, your, your analytical formulas become extremely heavy. So it's a trade-off. Again, if you, if you integrate over very long arcs, uh, then you gain anyway, because you have only a single evaluation of the formulas. Um, of course, if you rectify often, then you lose. So there is, there is a happy compromise. In the cases that, that we analyze, you, you generally gain at least 10 times in speed. A, okay, <laughs> the kinetic impact seems to be easy, <laughs> but it's not as easy as it appears. Um, one problem is that you, you actually have to hit the asteroid, which uh, is not so obvious. Okay, uh, and you want to hit it very fast, so your navigation <laughs> requires to be fast and accurate. Okay, and, and the second problem that I will uh, show uh, tomorrow. There is, in fact, the possibility that you are fragmenting the asteroid. For some asteroids, the composition, for example, for rubble pies, is such that when you hit at high speed, uh, it's, it's more like hitting a, a, a drop of water. Okay? The, the, the asteroid is, is not behaving really a, as, a, as a rock. So you, you kind of fragment the asteroid, but then maybe the asteroid uh, reforms again into a different shape. Well, if you have, if you have um, a rocky asteroid, it might be that you're fragmented the asteroid. And the fragmentation of the asteroid is not fully predictable. And what happens if you propagate the fragments? You will see that uh, you might not have a zero probability of an impact, even over a very long time. So the, the probability of hitting something remains different from zero. Okay? So if you, if you use something like this, you're essentially you're always below the threshold of fragmentation of, of the asteroid. And you have less of a problem of hitting correctly the asteroid because you are hitting with, with a, a huge cloud of, of particles. Of course, the problem here is how you control the particles. It's very easy to control a single object here, and you want to have Do you ever look at what would happen after you avoided the first predicted collision? Because obviously when you change the major axis like centricity, you change the mean anomaly, and then that means that after some time, the asteroid might come closer to Earth again. Uh, yes, it could. <laughs> Uh, it could. Uh, there are. Okay, it's, it's the, the problem is similar to saying. Um, okay, if if you change the phase basically of this encounter, okay, then you have to compute the next phasing points in which you are meeting the the, the asteroid. But this might correspond to a delay which is extremely high. Okay. Um, but there's also the chance that you are changing uh, a little bit the geometry of, 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 the, of the orbit by doing this. And you, in practice, you don't have really an encounter for centuries. Okay? So from a practical point of view, you avoid uh, the, 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 the real threat. Um, but probably Giovanni has uh, <laughs> Possibility to come back uh, uh, to a subsequent uh, uh, return 
depending on the deflection of the precipitator. It's a paper by Giovanni Valsecchi, Taller in Astronomy Astrophysics, 2003, that is related to the question. You mentioned early on that an impulse either in the direction of the velocity vector or opposite is much more useful than one that's normal. Do you think there's a, a possible explanation in just very basic physics that the energy contains a V plus delta V times V plus delta V, mm -hmm. so you get the maximum change, the energy actually gets a multiplying effect from the 2V delta V term? It, it, it's not mm -hmm. a total explanation, but do you think that's partial? Because you don't get that multiplier when, when the impulse is normal. Well, yeah, you, you have that, the, the, the work that you put into the deflection is totally used to actually deflect because you, are, you have the, the, cross, uh, the scalar product between your action and the, and the velocity, which is zero, so you have all the energy that goes into the deflection. Um, I think it's, it's more intriguing the fact that this is true up to a certain time. Uh, because I can understand, okay, you maximize the energy that you put in the deflection, but I understand even better the fact that that energy is better used because if you increase the time, you increase the deflection without doing anything. But all this is true up to a certain point. After that, it switches. And, and the best thing to do is actually to hit uh, perpendicular to the velocity. And, and that is a little bit more uh, subtle and I don't have an imme immediate answer to that. Any other question? Lunch? <laughs>